Welcome back to Comic Book History. This is episode 10. I know it's been a little while since I've done this series. I figured oh, why not, and I kind of forgot basically what I was going to originally do for this episode. But I figured oh, why not do this? This episode we're going to talk about the Justice League. And I'm talking about the era that lasted from 1960 to 1987. Next couple episodes I'll talk about the various other Justice League uh, various teams. One of the reasons why I'm talking about Justice League now because this year we have the Justice League film come out this coming November. I kind of figured, though, why the heck not? Now, the Justice League were created by, um, of all people, Gardner Fox and Mike Sudowski. I think, uh, Sigowski, I think that's how you pronounce as far as his name. Uh, they made their first appearance in Brave and the Bull number 28, and... This incarnation I consider to be the original lineup of Justice League. Despite the JLA Year One retcon that happened in the 90s, I've always considered this lineup to be the true lineup of the, the true original lineup of the Justice League up until the Flashpoint reboot in 2011. And these members are following: Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Flash, Green Lantern, Aquaman, and Martian Manhunter. These seven people, in my honest opinion, are the original founding member of Justice League. Not the incarnation that happened year one. That was a dumb retcon. It was a good series, though, but I've always considered it to be this, the true origin story of the true original team of the Justice League. Now, basically, when they first formed, uh, and when they debuted in Brain Bone 28, they teamed up to basically take on Starro. Yeah, basically they teamed up to take on alien invade. The they came together to fight an alien invasion. Sound familiar? Yes, because this is a similar idea that they used for the movie The Avengers, and plus also this was also used as the backstory of the reasoning for the Ultimates for how they came together. Yep, it's a similar idea, but the way the Avengers came together in the comics, it was completely different. I will discuss the Avengers in a later episode, but excuse me. But after the debut appearance in issue 28, they basically appeared in the following two issues. Well, first fighting Professor Ivo, uh, then fighting his android, Amazo. And then after, he, they, they got their uh, ongoing series, which lasted for 261 issues. And this was, of course, the first volume of the series. The series, of course, has, suffered, has gone through a few different relaunches over the years. But at least there was a good period of time be between each relaunch of when it was called Justice League America or JLA, as it was called. Now, here's something interesting, though. Um, the only per the only people to stay part of the Justice League throughout pretty much mostly of the 261 issue period is mainly, most of the time, it's been Marshman Hunter and Aquaman. Yeah, these two have been part of the team for pretty much the longest. Now, the original version of the Justice League team which they gets there from issue 1 up until issue uh, 230, um, when uh, Invasion basically changed the course of it. During the course of the first few years of the team, you had the introduction of some of the Justice League's most famous villains. People like Despero, Felix Faust, Dr. Light, uh, the three demon things, I don't remember their name. Uh, I'm trying to think, who else? Uh, Kendra Rowe, who also is an enemy of Adam Strange. I'm trying to think, who else, basically? Oh, of course, Starro. Uh, trying to think, though, who else made a debut in this period of time? Um, hmm. I'm trying to think, though. I think that's it when it comes to actual villains, when it comes to Justice League. Uh, yeah. Let's see here. Uh, Funhouse Aliens. Let's see. Anybody else? Let's see. I don't think there was anybody else. Oh, Dr. Destiny. Um, so, uh, not Sonar. Sonar was Green, Green Lantern villain. Uh, the original Queen Bee, who was uh, Zelala. Let's see. Who else? Uh, the Crime Syndicate. Brainstorm. The the original version of the key. The Royal Flush Gang. 
Shaggy Man, Antimatter Man. Let's see who else noteworthy villains. Um, Merlin the Archer, a known Green Arrow villain. He made his debut in the pages of Justice League. Nebula Man, I'll get to him soon. Uh, Injustice Gang, Libra, Carrie Bates. <laughs> yeah, this was kind of funny. Uh, Necron, not the same person who was basically started the uh, Blackest Night. The Manhunters, Construct. Um, let's see, who else? Um, Cadre, Paragon, and I think that's it. Yeah, these are the only known, known villains that basically, who debuted in the pages of the Justice League. Um, who basically fought them during this period of time. Now, they, they fought, now, originally during this period of time, the books were simply one-shot issues. Uh, it wasn't until the 1970s that they decided to change them, make it multi-part stories. And also in the 70s, they, had, they they basically, now, their original base of operations was, in fact, the Secret Sanctuary, which is the current location of Justice League America in the recent series, done, currently done by uh, Steve Orlando. Now, the book itself has gone through a bunch of different writers. The original writer, of course, was Gardner Fox. There was people like Daniel Neal, Jerry Conway, who was the most... who was practically the only person to write the highest number of issues and actually stay with the book the longest. He was with the book for nearly 20 years. Yeah, he finally left and then basically had the Demodius, who basically did the last six issues, which led into the relaunch. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, you also had a few new characters make their debut in the pages of Just Like America, like the retcon version the Black Canary showed up in here, uh, the Earth-1 version of the Vigilante showed up in here as well. I'm trying to think, who else? Oh yeah, the series was also known for the debut of the second, uh, Civ of, of the second, uh, version of Citizen Steel, and also the original version of Vibe and Gypsy. Characters related to get sort of redesign in the current continuity where Gypsy was a supporting character in the Vibe book and Vibe pretty much wore a costume that basically that the actor who basically the costume that, that, the, that the Vibe character on uh, Flash is going to be wearing as for Commander Steel. This is the second one and he is the uh, grandson of the original despite the fact you also have Nate Haywood from the JSA book. Uh, he is a cousin of his. Yep. Jericama created him. Now over the course of the book's History have various people joined the Justice League during this period of time, either as regular members or honorary. You have Green Arrow joining issue four, which is also the same issue in the pages of Avengers, where Captain America joined a group. You also have people like Adam, uh, the Keter or Hawkman, um, the second Black Canary. Let's see who else: Phantom Stranger, Long Game Man, uh, Red Tornado, Hawk Girl. Uh, Sh this is Sarah Hall. Uh, Satana, Firestorm, Steel, Vixen, Vibe, Gypsy, and that's it. Yeah, these were the only people who actually joined the Justice League. There was a couple people who actually were offered member membership Justice League, but they declined. Uh, these two people were Metamorpho and Black Lightning, two people who later helped, who basically Batman recruited as part of the founding members of the Outsiders. Now we'll get to them in a later episode. Now, in the case of Black Lightning. They did this over the course of two issues where he was asked to join the Justice League, but he declined. He has later on joined the Justice League. Uh, Metamorpho himself did not technically join the Justice League. Uh, he didn't join until the Europe era when he joined in issue 24. Um, as for Black Lightning, let's see, when did, the, when did he join the group? Um, not sure when, but oh, okay, here he is. Uh, he didn't join until the second volume of the series, when it was done by Brad Melitzer. Yeah, he was the one who actually put him on the team, because he had never been part of the team before, and at that point, he, he was bald, and what those were, was when that 70s disco tire that he was not wearing. But, but uh, basically, about two years into the book, basically, I think this was during the period of time when the book was published, uh... Let's see. Yeah, during a period of time when the book was publishing eight times a year, 
this was about two or three years into the title, they started the concept of the annual team-ups, which, which continued up until the 1980s, where, like, every year either for a two- or three-part story, sometimes even a standalone story, Justice League would team up with their Earth-2 counterparts, the Justice Society, a concept that will continue even to the present day, even after after Crisis of an Earth. Excuse me. And they have various reasons. Either, like, excuse me, either fight some one-shot villain, a, um, either that, or villains from both sides, basically, would team up to take on these particular people. Stuff like that. Uh, there's one other villain group basically who know from uh, know from, uh, frequent enemies Justice League, and that's a secret society of supervillains. You always had to say to make a debut in the page Justice League America because they made their debut in their own comic book. Now, the concept of these people were based upon the Masters of the from Marvel. Yeah, it's a similar concept, and plus known A-list villains know part of the group, along with uh, yeah people like the Injustice Gang. Uh, let's see. Basically, you have a bunch of different villain groups. Uh, the Royal Flush Gang is simply like the UFOs, just a group of people basically who wear costumes, not basically a gathering of villains like people tend to think of. Um, but that's how normally that th these groups work. Uh, the Crime Syndicate is simply put, like a lot of people who do know about the group, they're just an evil version of the Justice League. That's all they are. They just have different names, like Ultra, like Superman's called Ultraman, and there's also um, Warrior Woman, I think it's Superwoman, uh, Owl Man, Johnny Quick, uh, Power Ring, uh, Death Storm, Sea King, a bunch of other characters, but pretty much anybody who's, and here's something interesting though, um, whenever they have, whoever, whoever's the Green Lantern at that point, they have their counterpart basically as a Power Ring. Heck, even John Stewart has had one. Um, yeah, it's just the first three. Um, basically, it's them basically filling the role, and of course, also Thomas Wayne being. Uh, now, this Thomas Wayne is not the father of Bruce Wayne like it was in Flashpoint. This is his brother. Yeah, his name is Thomas Wayne Jr. That's how it's simply put when it comes to a particular character. Um, pretty much now the reason, now, they, they did exist in a secret sanctuary for about a little over 70 issues, and then they decided to change their base operations from the secret sanctuary to the satellite, a known base operations for Justice League up until the 1980s, and it was, the concept was brought back in the 2000s. Why did they decide to move there? Because their headquarters was discovered... Their secret base operations were discovered by, of all people, the Joker. I am not kidding about this. Yeah, Snapper Car inadvertently told the Joker who where the, the secret base operations were for the Justice League. And the Joker broke in and, and, and was a character called John Doe. And when he was revealed to be the Joker, I'm like, sweet Jesus, the Joker. They did the same thing in Young Justice as well, of why the Justice League moved from the secrets from Mount Justice, what it was called in that show, to the satellite. The reason why? Because the Joker broke in. Oculus was so hilarious. And then, of course, like, right in the following issue, when Justice League moved to the new satellite, they, uh, the, Vigil the Earth-1 Vigilante show up in the issue. Now, this is his only little appearance, because during this period of time, there was only just the version that gets on Earth-1. This is the Greg Sanders version, not the uh, version created by Mark Wolfman and George Perez in the 80s. <sighs> Completely different character. This is the cowboy. The other one is basically like DC's version of the Punisher. Yeah. Um, what else? Let's see. Well, the satellite did exist uh, from the 70s up until about uh, around the mid-80s, per se, when they decided to change it where um, the satellite was... was di they decided... Because of an because of an invasion from Mars, of course. Also, there was a brief period of time Mars Commander was briefly written out of the series because Mars had basically came back. Though they decided to change it and had them try to invade the Earth, and 
because of the fact at this point in time, Batman had quit the Justice League. Most of the founding members have already quit the Justice League at this point, with the exception of Aquaman and Marshman Hunter. So, so Aquaman decided to do something really stupid. He basically rewrote the charter of the Justice League. Also, I should point out that uh, at one point in Justice League history, they had a limit on the membership, basically 13 people. That's why, if you look at basically the membership list, it took a while before they finally added a new member to the team. On an occasion, they might add a new... Uh, either one or two reasons why they usually add a new member. Either one, they had an extension of how many people they add to the team. Excuse me. Or two, the reason why they added a member to the team, because they had another member quit, and they had to basically fill the ranks. The League of Superheroes has done this frequently over the years. Same thing with the Teen Titans. This is nothing unusual in the course of a comic book. I should point out also during uh, when Echo Heart was writing the book uh, from issues 139 to 150, this was a brief period of time when the book was basically made giant sized and the books became 40 pages long for basically a whole year. After Echo Heart left and Gary Jerry Collin came back on the book, the book went back to a standard sized format. And it stayed this way up until its final issue was relaunched simply as Justice League under the JLI era. And of course, when the book was when made to the Detroit era. Now, here's the thing about the Detroit era. This era basically, well, how should I put this? This era pretty much nearly killed the Justice League title. Yeah, basically sales slipped. Now, I have recently, re last year I read this era. This wasn't a bad era to read. I mean, yeah, they didn't have many people join the team. Basically, the whole idea of it basically was to get rid of the older members and basically be a carbon copy of the Teen Titans, which basically at that point was D one of these days highest selling titles. So they decided to do the whole teen aspect by recruiting people like of course Commander Steel, who actually offered a factory that he owned as the base operations for the Justice League, along with Vibe, because Vibe joined Justice League because Justice League is based the power of Detroit. Later on they added Gypsy. Vixen actually voluntarily joined Justice League, and this is how she became a member of Justice League. Now this happened in the second annual of the series. There were three annuals published. Uh, the first annual, which allowed the the uh, the second Sandman, the Garrett Sanders version, um, who was a creation Jack the King Kirby. He actually joined the team as an honorary member of the team, and it was a good annual by the way. And the second annual, because of the whole alien invasion thing uh, on Aquaman, basically. Now, Gypsy didn't join the team. It's about six issues into the era of the Detroit. The Detroit era wasn't too bad. After the first year of the Detroit era, because probably of the sales slipping, the uh, the original base operations when they were the Detroit era was basically deemed, they were basically evicted from it. So they decided to move back to Secret Sanctuary. And they set up their own teleporters in the thing because, of course, the satellite had one, too. An interesting thing about the satellite, the satellite was in ruins. Yes, seriously, it was in ruins. It had been that way because of, because of Red Tornado activating the station's self-destruct sequence and basically turning things into ruins. Heck, when, even when Despero came back, he was shocked that CW base operations destroyed. But the neat thing about the base operations is that the Justice League was the first time ever that a superhero team had a space station as their base operations. Marvel, so far, has never officially ex kind of... Ex they kind of have explored this concept with the Alpha Flight program, but an actual superhero team based in Earth orbit, the only kind of closeness they had to this is, is basically the Future Foundation when they had the space station called the Foundation, which only existed in the pages of the of the comic FF, a space station that was barely around even after Hickman stopped writing the title. But the only super team to be officially based upon a space station is the Guardians of the Galaxy. They're the only ones who've actually done that. Uh, but of course, that was nearest to the galaxy in the comic. But in the case of superior teams of Earth. In Marvel Comics, they've never officially explored this concept except when it's a government agency or a, a space program. But an actual superhero team based on satellite, that is something Marvel's never explored. DC has explored this concept, and the Justice League currently is the only team to ever do this. Now, villain teams have made have had their own version of, of the secret satellite. Uh, 
the Injustice Gang have done this, so a secret study of suit villains. Uh, one of the versions, because the, the original version was based off a skyscraper. Yeah. And you have various villains. Basically, a lot of the time was B or C list. It, it wasn't as bad as the Injustice Gang was in the 80s. Where it's basically a bunch of C-listers. Basically, half the time when you look at the Secret Society of Suit Villains, like their early version of them, mostly comprised of Flash villains. Not kidding. Flash villains. And, of course, there was other, like, Batman and Superman villains part of the group. Heck, there was even a group called the Anti-Justice League that appeared for one issue of Action Comics and formed by Queen Bee, of all people, and Count Vertigo... Not Count Vertigo. Uh, Merlin the Archer and... And, uh... Cut the boomerang as part of this group. It basically, it's just an evil Rouge, and it just basically the counter for Justice League only appeared for one issue of Action Comics. But this was a pretty interesting era of comics to read. Um, if you ever get a chance, go and find these books. These are really, really good books. Despite the fact the early stuff is kind of goofy, it does get a lot. It does. It is pretty interesting to read. Uh, DC has collected most of this, at least about most of this era in the case of their showcase books. Uh, there have been about five released, and they've only got to, I think about six released, and they've only got to 132. They've never gone any further than that. Nope, they never have. Excuse me. I was able to read these issues online for free. I'm not going to, you have to ask me personally what site I, have, I went to in order to get uh, a chance to read these books. But every single book is really, really good. Um, there's no bad issue when it comes to Justice League. Heck, even when it was the Detroit era, I didn't think it was bad. I thought it was still interesting. At least it was still a good concept. Uh, toward the end of the era, they added, they added Batman to the team. But um, even after they had Batman to the team, this did not help the title Basically, eventually the title was cancelled and relaunched as simply as Justice League. Now, I will talk about the JLI in the next episode. But, basically, this particular era, the first 27 years of the Justice League of being around, currently, as of, as of right now, the group has been around for 57 years. And DC has always had the Justice League. Not much in the case of Justice Society, but they've had always a Justice League. Okay, um, I'm trying to think though, was there anything else? Oh yes, I almost forgot. Uh, when the book celebrated 100 issues, they had it where um, they had their annual team up with the with the with the secret justice society. Apparently, it was their 100th team up. I have no idea how they explored this, and they also found a way to team up with the Seven Soldiers of Victory, another superhero team that operated in Earth Two. Multiverse concept. They had this back then. Not much in the case of now when a lot of superheroes may be on the same Earth. I'm trying to think. Oh, yeah, Neville Man was, was the main villain of that story. Um, of course, the cover of that first issue, of, of the Hunter issue, was reused for uh, Titan Hunt number one. It's just basically the same cover, just switched out Just Like stuff with uh, uh, the Teen Titans. I'm trying to think, though. What else? Uh, they had three parter where they. Uh, fought the fought Starro again in this epic three-parter. They fought the secret side of suit villains many times over the course of the title uh, during the course of this era. Um, let's see what else they uh, had brief crossover with All Star Squadron. And by the way, the Justice League version, the Justice League uh, issue that crossed the with All Star Squadron was not collected in the Showcase Presents All Star Squadron, which I was really ticked off with. I mean, come on. It references the issue. What? Because the issue was written by Roy Thomas. You could not put the issue in the damn book. I don't see why not. The book crosses over with the hick. The book ends where it says to be continued in this Justice League book. It really kind of throws people off. Excuse me. What are you doing? Don't put that in there. Now, there is an issue of Justice League America, issue 193, that does serve as a backdoor pilot to this series. In the form of a insert, DC basically explored this concept in the 80s, where they put inserts in books to, to basically spin off to other books. They did this for Captain Carrot, Night Force, uh, He-Man. They did this for a bunch of series in the 80s. It was a simple concept, just threw in a special insert or a preview for an upcoming series, and eventually they get a, they get a series. 
Uh, the Captain Carrot one lasted for a little over two years. Night Force was only was only fourteen issue comic was really good done by Marvel Quinn and Gene Cullen. When All Star Squadron came around, that lasted for sixty seven issues before it relaunched as as uh, Young All Stars. I will eventually talk about them. Uh, it's a really awesome series, and I highly recommend All Star Squadron. I will talk about that series eventually in the future. But this one was about the first era of Justice League. From 1960 to 1987. 1987 was also the same year that they relaunched it as the uh, Justice League International. Now, when the series uh, was relaunched at a period of time, that's when they had the crossover event Legends, which you can check out that video on my YouTube channel. Which check out here on my YouTube channel. Uh, check my audio only reviews. I think it, yeah, it's my first one. Check out my review of Legends uh, where I talk in full detail about the event. But yeah. Um, that's it for this episode. Stay tuned for next episode while I talk about the JLI era from 1987 to 1996. Okay? But until then, I will see you there.